Welcome to Discovering. The season of hunt raccoons in the Upper Peninsula begins October 15th. Right now, it's time for spring training. We'll usually go down roads that we can drive that are accessible and look for tracks. The dogs usually will strike off the rig, they'll smell them, and then hopefully there's a track that we know for sure that it's a coon. Then a visit with longtime boat builder Ed Nelson. The reason I designed this canoe is to get a wider canoe. That's all tonight, so put your feet up and the remote down. It's time for discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Raccoons are native to North America and their fur is used for clothing, especially coats and coonskin caps. As of 1987, the raccoon was identified as the most important fur bearer in North America in terms of revenue. But the seasonal hunt has dropped considerably since those days due to decreasing pelt prices. Coons are commonly taken by either trapping or hunting. Since the late 18th century, various types of scent hounds called coon hounds, which are able to tree animals, have been bred in the United States. A lot of what makes a coon dog chase coons is bred into them. But like any other hunting dog, they require some training. I spent the night in the woods with some UP coon hunters and their dogs on a spring training mission. All right, what I got here, I got two separate types of tracking systems that I'm gonna put on Doc. He's a four-year-old red tick male. I, I use two different types of tracking systems just in case one um, fails. This is the alpha system. If they cross roads, it's got lights on them for cars or, any, or just for us to find them. As you can see, they're pretty excited. I got Marty, the uh, walker, train walker over here. Marty, I already put his stuff on. They're all color coded. He always wears orange, Doc wears blue. And we'll go to the other side of the truck. For this training season, I have a pup here, six months old tomorrow. She's a leopard cur female. Once I, once I get them all collared, I go into my truck where I have the GPS that I can watch them. This GPS tells me right now Doc and Marty, they're both sitting. If I go over the little pup, it's saying that she's moving around inside the dog box. But if I click on one of them, it'll tell me the battery life of the collar that's on them, how fast they're running. It tells me everything that that dog is doing throughout the night. And then here's my map. Cold spell has finally stopped. Right now we got 40 degrees on the thermometer. Um, talked, uh, sitting on the tailgate for a little while, waiting for it to get a little darker. Stars are out. And uh, now we're gonna go down into some, hopefully, coon area and uh, see if we can get something to strike off the rig. The first type of hunting that we're gonna do is called roading. We'll put uh, four of the five dogs that we have down, we put them on the road, and uh, if there is a coon in the area or across the road, they'll pick it up. This kind of also gets all their excitement out of them so that the next spot that we go to, they're more focused and uh, ready to run a coon if there is one in the area. We'll usually do this for, uh, well this stretch is gonna be about three miles. Um, usually no more than that. And then we'll give them a little break in between the next uh, run.
Typically training season starts July 8th and at that time of year there are no cornfields that are growing so we're in the swamp area starting in October is when the actual coon hunting season starts and we'll usually hunt off of cornfields. After the fall hunting season starting in January that's when it ends it's back to the training season in the winter and we'll usually go down roads that we can drive that are accessible by truck and look for tracks. The dogs usually will strike off the rig, they'll smell them, and then hopefully there's a track that we know for sure that it's a coon. When it's warm like this and there's no fresh snow, you might be able to find some tracks, but you gotta rely on the dogs a lot more and you hunt off the roads because it's starting to get soft. Tonight we'll go down uh, some creek bottoms, walk through, and uh, hopefully the dogs will pick something up. What are you doing now? Now that we ran down, rode a little ways with them, they're more focused, so we got a spot where we treed last night. We're gonna see if that coon came back down and uh, ran somewhere else so we can train the dogs a little more. If they pick up that scent. Well, there's many different types of coon dogs. Um, we have three different types that we're hunting with tonight. Treen Walker, Red Tick, and then we also have three different uh, leopard cur, American leopard cur hounds. What we're gonna do is we're making a loop through a area where there's quite a few coon, coon in here. And we're gonna come back out onto the road and uh, hopefully we'll strike a track through here. Typically for coon hunting, from what I've learned uh, hunting this past year, you want one that's noisy, talking. We do have one that's silent on track, except when he trees. Fast, with a good nose. A colder nose can be good at times, as well as a hotter nose dog. That means the coon is near, close by. Well, when you're looking for a good coon dog, you want to look into the bloodlines. That's the start of it. If it's a good bloodline, it comes natural with the dog. I guess the hardest thing is training them off of certain animals, such as deer, coyote, porcupines. But if it's a coon hound okay. with uh, bred in them, it's natural. Well, we didn't have any luck going through little circle that we did there where there's usually some coon in there but that's why they call it hunting still training the dogs use their nose even though we didn't find anything but now we're going to do a little rigging each dog has uh, a hole for their head to stick out the side of the dog box and basically they're winding for coon that have may, may have crossed the road or in the area if there is one you'll know it because all the dogs will light up it's pretty neat you can cover a lot of ground because you can go 45, 50 miles an hour and those dogs will still pick up the scent of a coon that may have crossed the road. Just goes to show you how strong of a nose that canine actually has. <laughs> well, we just got to strike off the rig. Okay. We put down the two older dogs. They haven't really been able to pick anything up off the road yet. Come here, Marty. So we put another dog down that sometimes can pick up better than the other dogs. Just depends on what the situation is, but we haven't been able to get anything going yet. But that happens. You can strike one off the rig and not be able to trail it anywhere. On to the next spot. Well, what we did is we walked down this creek bottom. Oh, probably, I don't know, quite a ways, 500 yards. And uh, they picked up a track. We saw we saw the track, and the dogs worked it out. It took them a while, but right now they're they're trailing it. And at the moment, they're probably 220 yards away from us. So we're just kind of waiting until we tree it, and then we'll try to figure out what the best way to get into them is, and hopefully it's easy. <clears throat> and right now they're still, you can just very faintly hear them barking. Um, not real aggressive yet, but we'll see what happens. Keep your fingers crossed, fellas. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh,
do is we, when we get to the tree, if they're treeing, the dogs is our main main concern, main priority. When we get here, we want to make sure each dog is tied up uh, and each dog is okay and nothing, no, one's, no one's hurt. And then once we get all the dogs tied up, then we'll look into the tree and try to find the coon, use the coon, coon squall if we need to. And hopefully there's a coon in the tree. It doesn't always turn out that way, but usually. Well, what that does is it's um it'll get the coon's attention it's they call it a coon squall and it'll get the coon to look towards you move it move a little bit in the tree and if you can see an eye with your light you know it's, it's just an easy another tactic that we use to try to find them in the trees especially during training season in the summer when there's a lot of uh, foliage on the trees and or in a big spruce like this it's kind of hard to try to find the, the coon especially if they hug usually they'll hug real close to the base of the tree and uh, all you see is their back so you can't see their eyes so you use the squall and usually turn around and, and see an eye well this tree here we didn't we couldn't find the coon in there at all using the coon squall. Um, no eyes in the tree at all. But we're thinking because they, the way they worked the track, it was kind of difficult for them. So we're thinking it was an older track and the coon was in here maybe during the day. Uh, but he was definitely in here at some point, just not right now. <laughs> Some people like to paddle a canoe, some like to fish out of them, and some people, like Ed Nelson, like to build them. My dad built two sailboats when I was, you know, in the 40s when I was, you know, only four or five years old. And uh, that's when I learned to start working with wood and boat building. And he built two wood sailboats, and I've built one, and I built a 30-foot uh, fiberglass sailboat, which I bought the shell. And I've built at least 12 high-speed ice boats. And I say high-speed, these are fast boats. And I've built them for people in Canada, and I've raced them all over the country. That's where I got started. My dad was an ice boater when I was young, and then he built a sailboat. Then eventually, later on, when I was about 20, we got it back into ice boating. And I've been in that ever since. The reason I designed this canoe was to, to get a wider canoe. They're, most of them, I think, are too narrow. They're very tippy. My girlfriend goes with me while well, she's used to boating with me. She sailed with me and everything, but she comments, and no matter what, she never feels like it's going to tip. You know, never. It's really stable. You can step in it, and it doesn't want to start doing this on you. I can paddle myself, or if two of us paddle, it, go, it paddles real easy because it's only in the water that much because it's so light and flat. So it doesn't push a lot of water. I know when I was doing it, people told me, well, that's going to paddle hard. No, it doesn't. And the two of us carry it like nothing off the trailer or go to carry it down by the water. It weighs 52 pounds. All the ribs and the rails and the seats are white ash. In fact, it came from up in Michigan where I used to have some land. So I've got 13 ribs for every canoe. And then each rib has got three layers of ash. I coat them on something and then I put them up on there and I clamp them in the middle and then I start bending them around and clamping them as I go down. Then they sit for, well, at least, at least for 24 hours before I pull them off. And they want to spring out a little bit, that's why I put this tape on there to hold them. First I have to sand the sides off the ribs with a belt sander. As you can see, the glue is sticking out here. Then I put them back on, clamp them, and then I take a, I take a rasp and uh, then I file the rib so that it meets, meets this angle coming around here. So when I glue the planks to them, it's, it's right on there. It's not, not glued on the corner, it's glued on the whole rib. But I, I will clamp these up. Every one of them, there will be 13 on there, all clamped up when I start planking. So they're locked right in place. And then once the planks are on there, then they don't move. I, I buy 16-foot lumber. They order it for me special in Green Bay. It's Western Red Cedar. And I order it, well, next, next thing to select. And uh, then I saw it from both sides on my ripsaw, almost all the way through. 
right through the middle. Then I take it on the bandsaw and split it the rest of the way. When that's done, then I run, run it through the planer down to quarter inch thick. And that all, they all, the planks get put on with a staple gun. But I pull the staples after it's dry, after the glue is dry. And everything's glued together. There is not a, well, the only fastener in the whole canoe is a bolt at each end of the seats. Other than that, there's no fasteners anywhere in the canoe. It's all epoxy. I've got marks down here. Tells me right where the bottom edge of the first plank is, see? And I get the first one on and I go to two three inch wide, and then I hit the curve. Then I gotta go narrower. And when I get back to the bottom, then I go full width. I run one right down the middle, and then start going on the sides and cutting them on an angle to fit them in there. I board sand it like this to get it all smooth. Then when it's nice and smooth all the way around, then I put the fiberglass cloth on. The cloth goes on dry, and then I, then I coat the epoxy through the cloth onto the, onto the planking. And then after that's on, then I've got a, a red filler that goes on there, sand it a little bit, then I put a white filler on, which sands real easy. So I want it real nice and fair, you know, so there's no bumps or anything in it. And then I clear coat that with epoxy. Then that gets wet sanded out and then painted. On the outside, I gotta put the like a keel, it's about that deep, down right down the center. And then that gets glassed over to reinforce it so you can you can bump some rocks and stuff with it and not damage it. But there is a keel down the middle. It's it's only three quarters wide, seven eighths deep, and it goes almost to the ends. Then I put the reinforcing here to mount the seats. It's real you know, it's double thick, three quarter inch fur plywood up in there. And that gets bolted in. So this, this is hooked into the ribs and the planking and everything, so it's very strong. And then that keeps the boat from working this way too. I don't have any, I don't need any cross bracing in this boat. That's all white ash, you know, and I, I ripped that down and planed it and then clamped the outside one on, then come along and clamped the inside one on. First I put a filler sharp piece of cedar in between the ribs so that the inside of the rib is flush when I clamp the inside strip in. There's like a filler strip right here. And that makes it strong too because it's a sandwich. Well, this is, is laminated plywood, very strong. I slip a piece in underneath and then this one goes on top and they're all, it's all glued together along here. So that's really strong. You can lift on that or you can tie a rope through here. I got it so you can put a rope on there to pull it or whatever you want to do. This is, this is uh, top layer of birch aircraft plywood. And that's fir plywood underneath there. But, but clear stuff, you know, I don't put anything in there that's got any voids in it. These are all white ash. Yeah, everything's white ash. They're all gl glued together in the cross piece and then they're tied underneath with fiberglass right here like this and then they're laced underneath. This is a uh, flotation foam, but it's very strong, or you know, it's not flimsy. There's a, it's that thick in there, three quarters of an inch thick. So it's not only is it a place to sit on, but it supplies flotation to the boat, even though a wood boat will float, but. This seat is set further back. So the one in person in the front, and then I usually sit in the back there when that seat's further back so that the boat balances real good then. But if I was gonna go by myself in it, then I would sit on this one, and put my feet this way, so the boat wouldn't, wouldn't do this, or a canoe. So I got it set up for two people or for one. I don't, I've never built too much furniture, it's mostly boat stuff. Ice boats, sailboats. I've built a couple of eight foot prams. I designed a real good pram that I built two of those. Most of the stuff has been my own design, except that ice boat is not my design, except for the mast and the sail. A friend of mine used to live north of it, he passed away now, but we designed a whole new rig for it. And it, it just flies. 
That's it. There's probably, there's probably only uh, maybe 30 ice boats that are faster than that one right there in the whole country. And they're bigger, they're larger boats and they're all built on a carbon fiber, but that boat is all wood, the whole thing. Mostly basswood too, by the way. Uh, I've got some basswood upstairs that's 22 and a half feet that I use for building ice boats. So that was cut right around here. And I air dry it upstairs. Same with the white ash I had. That was stuff that I brought down from up around Faithorn, in fact. I used to have a 40 up there. And that was all air dried upstairs. Well, I like to build them because uh, they will do something. My ice boat will sail, my sailboat will sail. Of course, the canoe is very nice for shallow or quiet waters. Uh, I like to build stuff that I can do something with it, you know. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.